Okay, I'm doing it. The Fungi Challenge. Remember when I said that I wasn't planning to simulate underwater life, but got convinced by the community, forcing me to add a whole unplanned extra editor for algae? Yeah, it happened again. But fungi are mostly invisible to humans. And you know how I always say no simulation without visualization. So how would a fungus editor work exactly? For a long time I thought it couldn't be done. But here we are. For those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It has two game modes. There are scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements, but there's also a sandbox where you can build your own algae, plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. In the first episode of this series, I already quickly mentioned nutrients, a new soil statistic. It's a summary statistic for things like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, and it will be a simple requirement for plants. If it's there, the plant will live, otherwise it will die. What I didn't mention is that each plant will consume a little bit. Here you see how it looks in places where plants have been growing for a long time. So how can you refill it? That's where fungi come in. Every time something dies on land, it will add a bit of detritus to this location. And if a location has detritus, fungi can live there and will add nutrients back into the soil. The decrease of nutrients will be slow though, so it's not something beginner players will have to worry about immediately. But if you want to run the simulation for a little longer, fungi will be crucial for your ecosystem. And besides creating the nutrients plants need, they are also a new food source for animals. Fun fact, when researching what kind of animals typically eat fungi, I discovered that these are the same mouths that now only specialize for seeds and nuts, which is probably not a coincidence. If an area does not have nutrients, plants and fungi can slowly conquer it. As a first step, plants from elsewhere arrive at the borders but immediately die. This adds detritus to this location, so fungi can live there, which in turn will add nutrients. This means plants can now settle permanently and the cycle begins anew until the whole area is covered. The transition from detritus to nutrients will not work in areas with slow moving water however, so just like in real life, swamps will be low in nutrients. And as we saw in the first episode, plants that cannot get their nutrients from the soil will need to catch it themselves, so that's why we will see carnivorous plants wherever fungi can do their job. To teach the new nutrient mechanic to the players, I'm adding a new scenario, the swamp. It was actually a super simple scenario to make because it doesn't have anything special, with one major exception. Unlike the other scenarios, it starts with very low nutrient levels. At first, some plants might be able to survive here, but the task of the player is to quickly create a simple ecosystem of animals that actively visit plants, so that when nutrients run out and the plants are forced to switch to carnivory, there is enough prey to catch. With the whole detritus nutrient cycle in place, we have everything we need for our fungus editor to make sense. But we haven't actually solved the fungi challenge yet. How to visualize something that is mostly invisible. The first sparks, the rough beginnings for an idea, came to me while working on plankton. As you might know, plankton in this game is actually only phytoplankton, because that fit the simulation way better. Why not do something similar for fungi too, and focus mostly on the visible part? Why not make the fungus editor a mushroom editor? The first thing you might notice about this editor is that it is really simple. Perhaps it will stay that way, or perhaps fungi turn out to be a crowd favorite, and I'll add a million details like in the plant and animal editors, we'll see. The mushroom can be larger, which means the spores will go further, but the wind resistance goes down. And the cap can be larger, which means there are more spores and thus more offspring, but the temperature resistance goes down. On the right, besides the usual color bars and body size buttons, you can also choose what kind of cap you want, which among other things determines how spores will spread. For this cap, that's via the wind, which is convenient but won't be very effective on a planet with no wind. For this puffball, it's animal touch. And we've also got a splash cup, which spreads spores with the help of raindrops. Under the hood, the resizing of these caps does not work the same way for all of them. 
Some cabs kill the same in all directions, like this one, but for others, like this one, that turned out to look weird. So this one only scales on the X and Z axis. I've made it so this is something that can be configured per cab. As for the editor music, I googled around a bit for inspiration, but I only found music created for or by people who actually wanted to eat mushrooms, which is a really different kind of music, so that wasn't helpful. In the end, I decided it needed to sound like earth, like the soil below your feet. So I needed a really low organic sound. To achieve this, I used a bass clarinet, which I use everywhere in the game. but also a flotando playing style for the double bass. Flotando is a special style of playing with the bow closer to your face and minimal pressure on the strings. It gives a very breathy sound, almost like a flute, hence flotando. On top of that, I've added everyone's favorite reverb, Valhalla Shimmer, which I use in all of the editors. Another thing I wanted is to make it feel like this organism isn't one thing, it's everywhere. And for this I use lots of little mandolin notes. This style of ambient music is called a swarm. And I've linked it to my MIDI controller here, so I can control both the frequency and intensity of the notes, like this. And of course I couldn't help myself and also hide the game's main theme in there. For those of you that missed it, by popular request the soundtrack is also available separately on Steam. And yes, I will make sure to add all editor music as well. Now that I can actually see and feel the fungus editor, I'm starting to feel like with the fungi challenge, I was actually trying to answer the wrong question. I am not creating a scientific tool that should be 100% true to life, I am making a game for humans to enjoy. And mushrooms is what humans see. I am not simulating every possible animal either, just the ones that are really visible to humans. So the question shouldn't be how to visualize the invisible, but what is the visible part of fungi? Is there something we can change about this visible part? And would that change have an impact on the simulation somehow? And the answer to that is hell yeah. Today's first bonus body part is a slingshot-like horn inspired by the extinct Brontotheres, nicknamed the Thunder Beast. The second one is this vestigial wing. I've added these flightless penguin-inspired aquatic wings in the sea and sandbox update already, but to my surprise I continue to get requests for flightless wings. Now we have card ship display, these wings, with the sole purpose of showing off, also make sense. I expect them to evolve in situations where at least one sex has a lot of competition in places where the advantages of flight are not that strong. 